Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Some clarity began emerging this week on the actions being undertaken under the National Energy Crisis Committee to tackle South Africa's long-running crisis. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. NECOM finally briefed the media on the initiatives that it is pursuing. Yes, you know, NECOM was set up after the President announced the National Energy Action Plan in July 25 last year and since then there hasn't been a single briefing and there's been growing frustration be because it seems there have been briefings of the social partners uh, but that's a fairly contained group and society really hasn't had good insight into what is happening within NECOM and whether it's actually working. We hear it is but there hasn't been any insight and this week they took editors and <coughs> gave some insight into what the actions are. We know that the big picture is the two prongs to it are recovery of Eskimps, a uh, very badly performing coal-fired power station fleet, and the new build, and then adding new non-Eskim generation to the grid as quickly and as cheaply as possible. And they gave updates as to what this year could happen. And really the big headline is that about 8,800 megawatts of electricity capacity could be recovered, mostly from Kusile. Um, and, and then adding through immediate um, interventions to buy electricity through the standard offer that Eskim has now got money for and through day ahead markets which they also are going to be letting people bid into their power pool through imports, through liberating the whole rooftop solar market. So those sort of initiatives um, are underway as well as to give Eskim some immediate relief to buy diesel. So if all these initiatives come together, we know that every day we're between 4,000, 6,000 megawatts short because that's between stage four and stage six um, of power cuts. So we are, that's what we're short in the system. If we can add the 8,000 megawatts and, not, and discounting anything coming from a recovery of Eskom's um, fleet, own fleet, except for the Kusile element, that would definitely help stabilize things by the end of the year but it's really by the end of the year because many of these initiatives are going to take months to complete plus they announced that there's this load shedding reduction program potentially that's going to be launched probably by Eskom to buy short-term uh, project so between five and ten years well ten years is not short term but if they can come in soon um, but between five year and ten year PPAs that are going to be given Obviously this raises concerns about what sort of uh, electricity we're going to get and how expensive that's going to be. It raises the whole spectre of the power ships again. But those are the sort of things that we're now starting to get visibility of. All this comes amid moves to declare the crisis a state of disaster. Yes, <coughs> out of the a African National Congress, Le Hotle, uh, we heard that there's a view that we should declare this load shedding crisis a state of national disaster, which give governments the ability to intervene without uh, going through the normal uh, checks and balances. This has raised a lot of concern in society about whether they couldn't be, uh, couldn't open the way for corruption as it did during the COVID uh, period. There's no doubt load shedding is a crisis. It, and, and there's probably no doubt that it's a, it's a national disaster. I mean. Every one of us is being affected, every industry is being affected, food security is at stake. But whether this is needed or not, I suppose, is where um, society has its reservations and those reservations are very well founded. Besides the Generation Recovery Plan, Kusile remains a big focus area at ESCOM. That's right. So we've got the Generation Recovery Plan, which was announced a couple of weeks ago by the new ESCOM board and the, uh, the executives. And that's really about trying to recover sort of 6,000 megawatts over the next two years from the existing power stations. And that's really a focus at, at six power stations that are underperforming. But outside of that, we know that we have this, this, this real problem at Kusile, which is a new power station and was supposed to be five units of which were supposed to be in the system already and um, well actually all six but let's just say given what happened and the delays and everything we were expecting to have five units so that's 2800 megawatts that's 
more than two stages of load shedding that we're currently in because Kusila is only, only unit four at Kusila is currently operating. And the reason for units one, two and three, which were in commercial operation, are not performing. We know that they've been tripping regularly because of <coughs> the poor operation of the flue gas desulfurization unit. But in that poor operation and poor design of the stacks, the flue stacks that come out of the flue gas uh, desulfurization unit, there was a problem of a build-up of slurry into the, into the flues, into the west chimney. So there's three flues going into this west chimney, which is really a big concrete shield, a windshield. And inside unit one, that slurry build-up was so uh, heavy, it actually collapsed in October last year. And in collapsing, it compromised the flues coming out of units two and three as well. So all three are now inoperable. That's 2,100 megawatts. So there's a big focus now of how do we get these units back. Now, if we were to clean the slurry out uh, and get the permanent system working, it's going to take two years. Um, and there's it's been very cautious about key cleaning that slurry because there's, there's concern that the Western Tower could fail catastrophically. So the, the view is now that they should put, be allowed to put in uh, three temporary flues for units one, two, and three and be given an exemption from the Department of Environment to operate these outside of the air pollution standards. Now, that is definitely, in terms of load shedding, the quickest action Eskom could probably take to, to reduce load shedding uh, other than diesel by two stages. So I think there's going to be sympathy from the department and from NECOM definitely to do that. It's going to be interesting to see how the environmental community and the community surrounding Kusile, because we know it's a very polluted part of the economy. This is the first place where we're actually taking the sulfur out. So how do they respond? But I think, I think there is going to be an exemption granted and there are going to be three temporary stacks uh, built by Concor on that site. And these are big <laughs> 100 metre temporary stacks that have to be so it won't be immediate, but it's going to be between eight and ten months to bring the first unit back and then every month thereafter the other two. And I think there's going to be a sympathetic view and I think we are going to see an exemption for Kusile. What are we likely to hear in next week's SONA? I think we're going to hear maybe a bit more flavour to what NECOM's sort of slowly allowing us to, uh, to see from their side, both from the ESKIM recovery side and the, the non-ESKIM side of how we're going to add in uh, new capacity. I think society will be hungry to see what sort of incentives might be put in place or whether they will be for particularly solar, buying solar for rooftop solar and then being allowed to feed into the grid. Only 850 megawatts, uh, which sounds a lot, but it's, it's quite small of the, of the 8,000 megawatts that we're looking to recover and add um, this year is coming, is, is penciled in from rooftop. But we can already see with Cape Town taking the initiative around their feed-in tariff that there is potential for the metros, I think, to act fairly quickly to bring in rooftop capacity, both from businesses as well as households. But if households could be given incentive on top of that to add um, rooftop capacity as well as battery storage to their homes, I think that that would be welcomed by society. Obviously, paying for that's an issue and then we'd have to wait for the February budget to see how we would do that. But I think other than what's already out in the market, I think there'll be a lot of interest um, from citizens to see if there's going to be any incentive to allow us to build our own rooftop side of capacity. If a disaster is declared, would it help? It's a big question. I think the, the, at the moment the, the risks and benefits have to be weighed up. <coughs> Obviously that has been done in the ANC but I think they're looking at it very much from a, a party political perspective, the risk benefits analysis. Can they bring in things very quickly, such as power ships, using this as, a, as an instrument to, uh -huh, 16 months time, we're having this election, make sure that we're not in the stage six or stage four type load shedding, but at a much more tolerable level, level for society. So from a national political, party political disaster perspective, I think it makes sense. Whether it makes sense, from, a, from what NECOM has announced. It's not 100% clear to me. 
with a new additional, okay, there's definitely the Kusile exemption. If that can't be done through the normal course, maybe the national disaster, maybe that's a way of getting that Kusile. But there's such jurisprudence around pushback around environmental, uh, giving environmental exemptions that I think that would still land up in the courts uh, if they tried to use a state of national disaster to fast track that exemption. So I think it's more better there to get a compact with uh, communities and environmental groups rather than uh, using the state of that, a blunt instrument of the national disaster. Whether the Public Finance Management Act um, exemptions are needed at, um, for a whole lot of things for Eskom to buy, I think that a lot of that water has gone under the bridge and there's already a meeting of minds between Eskom and uh, Treasury around where it needs exemptions, where it can help. So I don't think that's a big low hanging fruit. So I can't see obvious places, but then that would really be up to the president now and the national treasury or whoever comes with the budget to say, where would this really help us? If it's just about <laughs> suddenly people seeing power ships floating into our harbors, I think there's going, the, the, the antenna is going to raise around corruption and there'd be more risk to, uh, to the um, society in terms of the blowback, uh, seeing that as corruption. But if it can be explained as to why, and it's very narrowly explained, and it's really under a very strong transparency spotlight, I see the official opposition does support it. And they obviously believe that they can shine transparency on this process. I think it was surprising that they supported it, but I think it's because their call for it predated the ANC's move towards it. So they obviously see it as less risky as society is at the moment. But, but I think it, unless there's a very narrowly defined set of parameters to what it's going to be used for, and that can be well communicated, and unless there's extreme transparency so that we don't have the sort of nonsense that we saw with COVID PPE tenders, then I, then I think society might accept it. But until those two pillars are in place, I think we should treat this with a good deal of uh, scepticism and with a health warning. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.